gather together. Well, tonight we're going to be looking at the Psalms. Let's look together at Psalm 93. We'll begin at verse 1 here in Psalm 93, and I'll begin in verse 1 and read all the way to verse 5 because there's only five verses in Psalm 93. Beginning at verse 1, reading to verse 5, the psalmist writes, The Lord reigns. He is clothed with majesty. The Lord is clothed. He has girded himself with strength. Surely the world is established so that it cannot be moved. Your throne is established from of old. You are from everlasting. The floods have lifted up, O Lord. The floods have lifted up their voice. The floods lift up their waves. The Lord on high is mightier than the noise of many waters, than the mighty waves of the sea. Your testimonies are very sure. Holiness adorns your house, O Lord, forever. Now, as we're looking at this section of Psalms, something I failed to mention to you, so I'll, I'll say it briefly here, is, uh, as you know, the Psalms are broken into five sections. And when we began in Psalm 90, we actually began the fourth book or the fourth section of the book of Psalms. Psalms 90 to Psalm 106 uh, compose what is called Book 4. And so we are presently studying what is called Book 4 of the Psalms. Psalm 93, as we have arrived here, is a psalm of praise. It's a, a psalm of praise to the God who rules over the entire earth. In other words, we need to remember that the Bible very clearly presents to us the fact that God is not a tribal God limited to a ge geographic location. As I've mentioned to you before, in the days of the Old Testament writing, the pagans surrounding the nation of Israel had a concept of gods that basically made them local spirits or local deities. And so if I were a, a, a Philistine or perhaps a, a Canaanite or whatever, I would have the god that I worshipped, but he would be a tribal deity. The Bible teaches, though, that God is the god over the whole earth. In other words, he's not limited to a certain location. He is not God of only the Jews there in the Middle East. The Bible tells us that he is the God over the entire planet. And that's what he's speaking about here in Psalm 93 when he says, The Lord reigns, he is clothed with majesty. The Lord is clothed, he has girded himself with strength. Surely the world is established so that it cannot be moved. Your throne is established from old. You are from everlasting. He is a God who is the Lord over everything, not just a certain location. Uh, the Bible in the book of, uh, of Exodus, Moses writing in chapter 15, verse 11 says, Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders? David in Psalm 24, 1 and 2 said, The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. For he founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. And later on in the book of Isaiah, chapter 45, verse 12, God says, I have made the earth, created man on it. I, my hands, stretched out the heavens, and all their host I have commanded. And so what we're looking at is a psalm that praises God for his majesty and his strength. Notice in verse 1 how he says, The Lord reigns. He's clothed with majesty. The Lord is clothed. He has girded himself with strength. Surely the world is established so that it cannot be moved. So he begins by proclaiming that God rules as the king over everything. Notice he says he is clothed with majesty. In the Old Testament, clothing is regarded as, a, as an extension of the person. And so what he's doing here is he is demonstrating that he is majestic in all his ways. And not only that, I want you to see this. It says the Lord reigns. And when it speaks concerning the Lord reigning, in verse 2, your throne is established from old, it's a way of saying... God has the right to rule because he is the rightful ruler over all things. God's genealogy, if you will, goes past infinity, past the vanishing point. He has a right to rule because he's God over all things. He has a right to the throne. Psalm 90 verse 2 says, Before the mountains were brought forth or ever you had formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Psalm 45, 6, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. And again, Psalm 145, 13, your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. Your dominion endures throughout all generations. So God's throne is established from old. He is from everlasting, and he is clothed with majesty, and he is clothed with strength. 
Now, with that in mind, the floods have lifted up, O Lord. The floods have lifted up their voices. The floods lift up their waves. The Lord on high is mightier than the noise of many waters, than the mighty waves of the sea. Now, when he speaks of the floods, floods are ocean currents. They're also known as rivers or even underground streams. God is in control of all things, even though some things will come against us. The floods, floods can lift themselves against us like waves that are crashing on the seashore. And the things that you go through sometimes can be so severe that you can hardly hear your own thoughts, let alone the voice of God. Something we need to understand is that the psalmist is saying something that I want to bring a personal application to so that we can practically apply this. What the psalmist is saying is there are waves that rise up and can smash on the shore, and they can flood and destroy everything they come into contact with. We have seen in our day the power of water, the power that water has over everything. And we don't really realize that. I'm sure most of us never really think about that, and unless you're caught in a flash flood, unless you're in a, in a hillside community, and it's been raining and raining and pouring rain, and, and you had summer uh, fires that burned all the vegetation, and, and there's nothing that's going to be able to, to hinder the water from, from just cascading down that mountain. And, and there you are in a mountain village, and, 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 and there's the, the road that is coming down towards you, and, and you hear the sound of a rumble, and you look up, and, and here's water pouring down towards you several feet high. And the power of that is, is of such immense capacity that, the, that it just moves everything from its path. It doesn't matter if it's a car, it doesn't matter if it's a house, whatever it may be. It's just overwhelmed, and the flood destroys. It overwhelms and destroys because nothing can withstand the flood. And so the point he's making is, is that God is the God over all creation, and there's nothing that is too great for him. And when you go through floods in your life, when you have things that are crashing down on you, that are tearing you apart, God is the one that will be there for you. He's the one who's going to protect you through all of that. Every one of us over a lifetime will get pounded by waves more than once. Every one of us go through times that are so hard and so difficult. We're carrying burdens in our life, and sometimes our burdens can cry out as loudly as the sound of waves that are pounding on the shore. But the point he's making is you need to understand that, that even though you might be carrying a burden that is so immense and so incredible, even though you may be carrying something right now in your life that is just weighing you down so terribly, you can call out to God, and God will hear you. In the book of Matthew, if you'd like, turn with me for a moment, please. Matthew chapter 11. I want to remind you of something found in, in chapter 11 of Matthew. Matthew chapter 11, Jesus is speaking there in verses 28 and 29. And in Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 and 29, he issues an invitation Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. When he speaks of coming to him, you who labor and are heavy laden, come to me, you who are burdened. Come to me, you, you who are carrying something that is so incredibly heavy that it's weighing you down and, and you feel like, like the world is crushing you. Come to me, you who, who go to sleep at night with a tear in your eye and a broken heart, and you wake up the next morning not soothed whatsoever, not having rested whatsoever. You wake up the next morning feeling even worse than you did the day before. He says, come to me. Come to me when you're carrying your burdens. Come to me when you're lost and lonely. Come to me when you feel that nobody loves you or understands you. Come to me and, and, and cast your care on me because I care for you. If you're carrying a burden, he says, I can carry it for you. He says, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. You see, the problem many of us have is we carry our own burdens. And not only do we carry our own burdens, we carry the burdens of those uh, around us, those who will cast their burdens on top of us. And sometimes, of course, we are to bear one another's burdens and fulfill the law of Christ. And yet many times we're carrying things that we're ought not, we ought not to carry. I can still remember when my 
my dad and my mom, on one occasion, my dad was talking to my mom, and I can still remember my mom sharing this with me, how my mom had uh, something she was going through, and, and uh, she was speaking to my dad, and my dad said, you know, honey, he said, you can, you, can, you, can, you can hand that to me. He said, you can hand that to me. He says, because I have broad shoulders and I can carry that load. Well, that was a husband speaking to a wife, and a lot of us understand exactly what my dad was telling my mom. My dad was saying, I'll be your support. I'll be your strength. I'm here for you. You know, you don't have to carry that by yourself. You've got somebody who loves you, somebody who cares for you, somebody who will help you. We understand that. But you want to know something? As much as my dad loved my mom, my mom had burdens that only the Lord can carry. And sometimes we want other human beings to carry burdens that only God can really carry. And we get disappointed in people. We, we say, well, if you really loved me or understood me, if you really, really cared about how I feel, well, you'd be there for me 24-7. You'd be there all the time for me. And, and every human being can say, well, you know what? I'll do the best that I can, but to be honest with you, I really can't carry your life and mine at the same time but I know somebody who can, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, one of the things I like to encourage our fellowship to is to always remember that because human beings get disappointed in other human beings because sometimes we may look at somebody and think them to be a certain thing, and they may disappoint us, and then, then, then we're hurt and, and we struggle and all, but there's one person I know and, and, and who, who never disappoints anybody, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why he says, cast your care on me. That's why he says, you can, you can take my yoke upon you. He says, it's an invitation. Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. I will give you rest. It's the same sentiment that we have here in this psalm as we turn on back to the psalm, Psalm 93. It's the same sentiment there. The Lord is there capable of carrying us through life, but we need to remember God is on high, and, and God is mightier than any noise of any, any mighty water. He is, he is more powerful than any force that comes against us, but we need to come to Him first. Now, Paul says in Romans 8, 31 and 32, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare His own Son, but delivered Him up for us all, how shall He not with Him also freely give us all things? If God is for us, who can be against us? And so that's what the psalmist is reminding us of, even as he says in verse 3, the floods have lifted up, O Lord, the floods have lifted up their voice, the floods lift up their waves. The Lord on high is mightier than the noise of many waters, than the mighty waves of the sea. Even though things come against me, I need to remember that God is mightier still. And then in verse 5, he continues on to say this, your testimonies are very sure, Holiness adorns your house, O Lord, forever. Holiness adorns God's house, and His testimonies are completely trustworthy. The Bible says the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. You can trust the Word of God, and because God is holy and where He dwells is holy, uh, we can trust Him when He speaks to us. His testimonies are very sure. So we go to His Word, and we trust Him and take Him at His Word. Now, Psalm 94, beginning at verse 1, is the psalm concerning vengeance. O Lord God, to whom vengeance belongs, O God, to whom vengeance belongs, shine forth, rise up, O judge of the earth, render punishment to the proud. Lord, how long will the wicked, how long will the wicked triumph? They utter speech and speak insolent things. All the workers of iniquity boast in themselves. They break in pieces your people, O Lord, and afflict your heritage. They slay the widow and the stranger and murder the fatherless. Yet they say, the Lord does not see, nor does the God of Jacob understand. So this is a psalm that calls for God to intervene and to judge the unrighteous. And notice how the psalmist is crying out to the Lord to judge those who proudly oppress God's people. In verse 1, he says, O Lord God, to whom vengeance belongs. So this is a psalm that echoes what many people have cried out over the years. He's saying, God, rise up, God, judge. God, when are you going to move? When are you going to do something? Verse 2, rise up, O judge of the earth. Render punishment to the proud. Lord, when are you going to do something? When are you going to deal with the wicked? How long, he says in verse 3, will the wicked triumph? How long is it going to take? How long is it going to be? When are you going to do something about that? It reminds me of Jeremiah in chapter 12, verse 1, when, when Jeremiah the prophet said this. He said, righteous are you, O Lord, when I plead with you. Yeah, let me talk with you about your judgments. Why does the way of the wicked prosper? Why are those happy who deal so treacherously? When are the evil going to get what they deserve? Anybody here ever ask that question? 
Lord, when are you going to just break some teeth? When are you going to deal with some of this? I don't know why they get away with that. How can they get away with this? Well, that's what the psalmist is speaking about. He's saying, Lord, it's time for you to intervene. I'm asking that you would. You need to deal with these people. When he says in verse, verse 1, uh, O God, to whom vengeance belongs, shine forth. He's simply saying, Lord, would you please move? Well, what is it that they're doing that's so bad? Well, verse 4, they utter speech and speak insolent things. All the workers of iniquity boast in themselves. They break in pieces your people, O Lord. Afflict your heritage. They slay the widow and the stranger, murder the fatherless. Yet they say, the Lord does not see, nor does the God of Jacob understand. Now, he's crying out for God to punish the proud. And he, sa he says, look at what they're doing. They boast arrogantly of their power. They persecute believers. They torment God's children. They afflict the most helpless in the land, and they even kill the orphans. And they're doing this thinking that God does not see. They're doing this thinking that God will not act against them. They do something, and there's no immediate movement on the part of God to stop them and punish them, and so they think they're going to get away with it forever. Well, the bottom line is, is they don't have wisdom. They don't have the understanding that God indeed does see and God does act. The psalmist in Psalm 10, verses 11 through 13, says it this way. He has said in his heart, God has forgotten. He hides his face. He will never see. Arise, O Lord. O God, lift up your hand. Do not forget the humble. Why do the wicked renounce God? He has said in his heart, you will not require an account. They think they're going to get away with it. They think that God is not taking a record or keeping a record of the wrongs that they're doing, and they're absolutely wrong about that. So he goes on in verse 8, and he says, Understand, you senseless among the people, and you fools, when will you be wise? He who planted the ear, shall he not hear? He who formed the eye, shall he not see? He who instructs the nations, shall he not correct? He who teaches man knowledge? The Lord knows the thoughts of man, that they are futile. Now, I want you to see something here. In verse 8, he says, understand you senseless among the people and you fools, when will you be wise? The Bible uh, makes it clear, especially in Proverbs. When you study Proverbs, you'll see this um, repeated, that a person is declared to be a fool or senseless because God is not in all of their thoughts, because they reject God. And for the person who rejects God, they're regarded in Scripture as being a fool. You see, the Bible says God gives wisdom to the ones who seek after him. In Proverbs 9, verse 10, the Bible says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. In Proverbs 2, verse 6, the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. In that these are rejecting God and saying that God does not take note of what they're doing and doesn't understand in that they're doing that, the Bible tells us they're being foolish. And in being foolish, they are waiting for and actually going to ultimately become those who are judged. They're going to be dealt with. Now, in verse 12, he says, Blessed is the man whom you instruct, O Lord, and teach out of your law, that you may give him rest from the days of adversity until the pit is dug for the wicked. For the Lord will not cast off his people, nor will he forsake his inheritance, but judgment will return to, to uh, righteousness, and all the upright in heart will follow it. And so in contrast to the fool who doesn't listen to God, he now says God blesses the one who will. Now here's your question. How does God instruct people? How does he instruct somebody? And the answer is through his word. Notice how it says, and I want you to see this. Blessed, in verse 12, is the, is the man whom you instruct, O Lord, and teach out of your law. That's how you gain wisdom and understanding. It's not through reading People magazine or even the Encyclopedia Britannica. The way that you gain understanding and wisdom to live is through the Word of God. And so he speaks concerning the fact that God instructs. And I want you to see this when he says, blessed is the man whom you instruct. So there are two basic ways that we can see that God instructs. And I'm, I'm not going to try and take you through a variety. There are so many others that I could share. But I want to give you two basic things. One is God instructs you primarily through his word. And so you get up in the morning, and uh, you're getting ready to go to work, 
And before you climb in the car or whatever it is that you're going to do that day, you take a few minutes to, no, to open up the Bible. And you have a, a book that you're reading through. Perhaps you're going through the Bible in a year and all, and, and you read that section. It takes you 15 minutes to do that. And what has happened is God has instructed you with his law. He's given to you your feeding, your spiritual nourishment for that day. And I've discovered, as you have, that when I'm reading the Word of God, very often the things that He is in, imparting to me are the things I'm going to be using that day. They're going to be things that He wants me to share with people that day from what I've been reading. And so the first thing He does is, is when you're reading the Word of God on your own, He's teaching you. And then there's a second way that that works, and that works by the power of the Holy Spirit in His Word and also through the teaching of the Word of God, even as you're here tonight getting a Bible study. So when you gather here in this room on a Wednesday night or Sunday or whenever it is that you gather, God is instructing you through His law by His Spirit through His Word. In, uh, in Matthew, in chapter 10, verse 20, uh, Jesus said, It is not you who speak, but the Spirit of your Father who speaks in you. When we get into the Word of God, and the Word of God is being rightly uh, divided, correctly presented, the Spirit of God is anointing the message and the Word of God is going forth having an impact and effect in your life. And so, one, you read the Word of God with the help of the Holy Spirit who instructs you, and two, you get into Bible studies and you receive teaching, and it's the Spirit of God instructing through the teaching of the Word of God. So many times people say, I wish the Lord would speak to me, and God would say, but I have spoken to you, and I do speak to you. I speak to you through my written Word. It's that book that you have there that you pick up and you can open up and you can read and you will hear my words spoken to you, words of life, if you desire. Not only that, you hear the Word of God in a Bible study when the Word is rightly divided and presented and the application is correct. It's the Lord speaking. And so that's what he's referring to when he says in verse 12, Blessed is the man whom you instruct, O Lord, and teach out of your law that you may give him rest from the days of adversity until the pit is dug for the wicked. God wants to bless you all the days of your life. For the people will not cast off his, for the Lord will not cast off his people, nor will he forsake his inheritance, but judgment will return to the righteous, to righteousness, and all the upright in heart will follow it. And so God will minister in that way through his word. Verse 16, who will rise up for me against the evildoers? Who will stand up for me against the workers of iniquity? Unless the Lord had been my help, my soul would have been settled in silence. If I say my foot slips, your mercy, O Lord, will hold me up. In the multitude of my anxieties within me, your comforts delight my soul. So he knows that his help will not come from a man. His help comes from the Lord. And though he experiences troubling thoughts, I want you to see this, he rests securely in the Lord, who is the one who provides help for, for him. Notice verse 17. Unless the Lord had been my help, my soul would have soon, my soul would soon have settled in silence. If I say my foot slips, your mercy, O Lord, will hold me up. So God gives to you help and comfort. If you're taking notes, I want to give you this scripture here. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. God gives you comfort and help, and I want you to see that in verse 19. In the multitude of my anxieties within me, your comforts delight my soul. Well, one, it makes it clear that even a man of faith or a woman of faith can have troublesome times or anx anxious thoughts. Every person can have them, and uh, you are not necessarily a faithless scoundrel if you do. The fact is that there are things that we go through that are testing us, purifying us, and giving us opportunity to trust the Lord. And so when we go through anxious moments, we can call on the Lord who gives us peace and gives us victory over that. But the peace and the comfort that God gives to you is never just for you alone. And this is a very important point. The peace and comfort God gives to you is never simply just for you. When God gives you peace and comfort, when God is there strengthening you, it's in order to enable you to be strength and comfort on his behalf to somebody else. How do we know that? 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. So I was in my early 20s. I was going to school. I was at Biola, Biola College in La Mirada, going through a spiritual crisis. And I went to see my professor, a dear, dear man who I loved very much. And I explained my situation to him. And he looks at me, and he starts to rebuke me with Scripture, which I really didn't appreciate at the time, but I do now. I'm thinking, you know, oh, you know, how come you're so mean to me? Why aren't you being nice to me? I'm hurting. Uh, he didn't seem to think that mattered much and uh, started rebuking me, rightly so, by the way. And he said something to me I've never forgotten. I was about 25 years old or so at the time. And he said something to me that I have never forgotten. He said this. <clears throat> he said, David, he said, You're, you have a call by God for ministry. He said, you have to get through this trial because you will encounter others who are going through the same kind of thing when you minister. If you do not heal from this which is afflicting you right now, you will never be capable of helping somebody else when they come to you in need of healing. And at that point, I looked at him, and I was thinking, you don't know what you're talking about. You know, when you're 25, you know everything. When you're 54, you're stupid. <laughs> but at 25, I knew everything. And I'm looking at him, and I'm thinking, you don't know what you're talking about. You know, I don't know what you're talking about, but you want to know something? He was right on the money. Because he said, listen, he said, as a minister of the gospel, you take a message to people that God is capable of giving you strength to overcome anything. And if you don't allow him to bring healing in your life, you will never be able to encourage others because when they come to you, all you're going to be able to do is say, well, the Bible somewhere says this, but you haven't first been partaker of that. So you need to heal. And you want to know something? That's absolutely right. We give comfort to people, not from a philosophic or theoretical level. We don't have an ivory tower existence where we're really not part of what's going on down there. We live in, you know, a higher elevation, and we never, ever go through anything. That's not true at all. We walk through the world together, don't we? And our feet get dirty together. And sometimes we fall down together, and we hurt together, and we weep together, and we, and we sorrow together. We go through anxiety together. But we always know that God is stronger. God is greater. God is able. God will heal us. And when he does that, we can turn around to somebody else and say, listen, been there, done that. God is good. He'll bring you through it. That's the comfort you give to other people. There's one thing, if you go to school, and I know of a pastor, a fellow who went through four years of college, went into his three-year program for his Master of Divinity, went into a doctoral studies program, ultimately got a doctorate in theology, applied for ministry, and was not hired anywhere because they said, you've been going to school all these years, you don't even know what people are really all about. You're detached from them. You're not capable of, of, of being there amongst them. That's what Jesus was like. Jesus would sit down and he would eat meals with the publicans, he would eat meals with the sinners to the point where people would say, your master eats with publicans and sinners. If he eats with them, he must be one of them also. Jesus was able to walk amongst the people, and he saw the burdens that they had. And as a matter of fact, he even suffered alongside of them when he died on the cross. He took upon himself the sin of the whole world and, 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 and sensed that, that, that moment when he said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He, he sensed in himself as he was taken upon the sin of the world the sense of alienation that that man has when sin is in their life. And, and he was able to understand that in every way he was tempted in all ways even as we are and yet was without sin. In ministry, when you're serving the Lord as a Christian, you don't run around saying to people, you know what, I, I pity you because you're so down there and I'm so up here. No, what we are is we're, we're, simply, we're simply beggars who can tell another beggar where they can get a good meal. The Lord has taken us and touched us and saved us and he comforts us and we're capable of taking that comfort and saying, you know what, 
God is good. Been there, done that, understand that. Don't want to go back, but I can give you a way out of that, and that's through Jesus Christ, you see. And he'll take you out of that, and he will heal you, and he will give you victory. You can have that if you turn to him. And that's what takes place. And God comforts, and that's what he's saying in verse 19. In the multitude of my anxieties within me, your comforts delight my soul. He goes on in verse 20 and says, Shall the throne of iniquity, which div now I want you to see this, which devises evil by law, have fellowship with you? They gather together against the life of the righteous and condemn innocent blood. I was reading this psalm the other day, and verse 20 just stood out to me, and I want to share a little bit with you. Shall the throne of iniquity which devises evil by law. Look at that phrase with me. Devises evil by law. Shall they have fellowship with you? So one, this speaks of rulers who seek to destroy the righteous by making unjust laws. That's what it means. This answers the question that we are hearing today. And I'll be careful not to go on too long about this. But all of us are hearing this, and I think that it's worth my bringing up. I was in, uh, where was I? I can't remember. Was it El Salvador? El Salvador. When the presidential election took place. Bob Grenier and John Milhouse and I were watching the returns and uh, were, you know, amazed at what was going on and all this time. Four years ago, we were in Colombia when that was taking place, and, and this time we we're in El Salvador, and John Milhouse was saying, John is 56, he was saying, do you realize that if we're back here for the next presidential election, he said, that, that I'll be 60 years old, he said, and, and Bob Grenier will be 61 years old, and, and me, I'll be 58 years old. He said, you realize how old we're going to be? I said, talk about yourself, man. You're older than me. <laughs> but we were there, and we're listening to the returns and everything, and then, you know, we've been watching. We were able to get CNN, and we were able to hear what was going on, and, and I was able to watch the uh, concession speech of Senator Kerry and... And, and all, and uh, then the fallout, and all of us are experiencing this. I'm just commenting on something all of us have been thinking, I'm sure. Then the fallout. And now everybody's saying, what happened? We were so sure that the MTV generation was going to elect Kerry. You know, what happened? You know, that's, that's what's going on, isn't it? What happened? Those intellectual, redneck, hillbilly, fundamentalist Christians... What's going on here? And, and I'm hearing right now, and so are you, that, you know, many people saying, wait a minute, the Democratic Party has values too. That's true. That's why I voted for Bush. But anyway, <laughs> and I want to make mention of something, and I, I'm, I'm quite, you know, quite serious when I do this. Because I'm, I'm hearing some, some people are saying that we need to take the West Coast and some of the portions of the East Coast and secede and become a nation of our own. Um, some people are saying we're going to just go to Canada for four years until we can come back and, and live under the presidency of Hillary and, and uh, all of that. And uh, so, but the question uh, is, what happened? And now people, who are, people are saying this, you're hearing this, moral values determine the presidency. That's what they're saying. Moral values determined the presidency. And that's right. That's exactly right. They hit it on the head. But they're shocked. They're shocked right now. And many voters have stated that, that uh, their moral convictions determined their vote. That's exactly what I and many other ministers were saying during this time. Your vote is a moral statement. And what is amazing, and forgive me if I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rattle on for a while. Get ready. Um, I've been gone. <laughs> but that, that was the whole point. And, and what's amazing to me at this moment is the people spoke. They spoke very clearly. We don't like the values that you presented to us. That's what many people said, perhaps not you, but that's what I was saying. That's what I was trying to say to you. I don't like the values that are being presented to me. I don't like the values where you say that a person's right to choose is a greater right 
than a child's right to live. I, I don't like the idea that somebody would say it's, it's, it's okay to have a, a baby partially born, remove its head from the mother's womb, and, and slide a tube up the base of its neck into its brain and evacuate the cavity there, and then put him back in, which is called partial birth abortion. I, I, I never saw the morality of that, nor the need of such a thing. And, and then suddenly, one presidential candidate is going to church. <laughs> which is great if you got the gospel there, but he wasn't getting the gospel. He was preaching his message. I already heard his message. I already heard his message when he was speaking concerning the things that he believed in. So Gallup reported 61% of the people who regularly attend religious services voted for President Bush, compared to just 30% of the vote among unchurched adults. Similarly, those who describe themselves as committed Christians chose the incumbent by a 60% to 39% margin. Those who said they were deeply spiritual preferred the president by a 58% to 41% gap. Voters who said they were concerned about moral conditions of the nation registered a 55% Bush vote. Adults who have an act of faith, that is, in the past week they attended a church service, prayed to God, read the Bible outside of church, also provided the president with a two-to-one margin of preference, 67% to 33%. Overall, born-again Christians supported President Bush by a 62% to 38% margin. In contrast, non-born-again voters supported Kerry by an almost identical 59% to 39% division. The difference was in the rates of turnout of each segment. Although the born-again population constitutes just 38% of national population, it represented 53% of the votes that were cast in the election. Your vote matters. Your beliefs matter. And, and those of you who voted your conscience in a certain way, I'll just put it this way, I voted in a certain way because I saw what was being presented as really a moral cultural war. Because we all know that our president does not determine the direction of our economy there are philosophies that you can bring in to bear in all of that, but our Congress determines the direction. There's so much I could say about that. I'll refuse to do that. Don't, don't worry. But I do, think, I do think that what you are doing is you have, you ha when you're voting, is you're making a determination as to what person's morals line up closest to mine. And with the knowledge that the next president of the United States is going to be, Bush is going to be nominating four Supreme Court justices and knowing that, that the will of the people is being overturned by activist judges. It became extremely important for us to be praying that God would put somebody in that position who lines up with your moral beliefs that you derive from Scripture. And the thing that's interesting, and I'll go into one last thought, the thing that is interesting to me about this is after everything was said and done and the dust began to settle, people are standing up saying, but we have moral values too. We just didn't clarify them. And I'm sitting there watching them saying, no, you did clarify them. The problem is, is you don't understand faith actually lives in street clothes. You don't understand that people actually take the Bible not just to church, but they read it at home. You don't understand that Christians are sincere about what they believe, and it affects the way that they live. You think that religion is something that everybody should have a little of, just because it's a good thing to have handy. Where evangelical believers believe it's not only important to have it, it's important to share it so that people can have a faith in God and have a transformed life. That's what they don't understand. That, in a nutshell, is what they're not understanding right now. And the bottom line is, is when you have somebody who is representing the nation as the president, the, the, the most powerful person in the world, well, we better be careful 
that we vote our consciences and pray that God puts the person in that he wants, of course, and that we're in line with him. Now, am I saying, I ought to say this. This will be the only time I say it. I won't even say this Sunday. This is the only time I'll say it. Am I saying that President Bush is God's man? No. I'm not saying he's the savior of the world. I'm not saying that the president of the United States is going to lead us into the promised land. What I am saying is I am just wanting to be aware of the climate that I'm living in and be aware of the fact that if I ignore, if I ignore what's taking place, that ultimately evil will prevail. And when the psalmist said, shall the throne of iniquity which devises evil by law have fellowship with you? The answer is, no, it shall not. And so I'm very careful to uh, do the best that I can to remember that my religious faith determines my worldview and my perceptions. And I don't want someone who simply mouths words of faith or visits churches as a campaign I want someone who actually lives out their faith in a straightforward way, even if I don't agree with them. At least I know what he believes. And to me, that's a very important thing. Okay, I'll stop there and keep going. Verse 21, they gather together against the life of the righteous and condemn innocent blood. But the Lord has been my defense and my God, the rock of my refuge. He has brought on them their own iniquity and shall cut them off in their own wickedness. The Lord our God shall cut them off. So God is my defense. God will protect the righteous, and God will judge the unrighteous. And ultimately, the unrighteous reaps what he has sown. And finally, Psalm 95. This is a, 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 a happy psalm. I'll close, you with, close with a happy psalm. Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God, the great king above all gods. In his hand are the deep places of the earth. The heights of the hills are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion and as in the day of the trial in the wilderness when your fathers tested me. They proved me, though they saw my work. For 40 years I was grieved with that generation and said it is a people who go astray in their hearts and, and they do not know my ways. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. So it's a call to worship here. The psalm, Psalm 95, is a psalm calling believers to worship the Lord. Notice he's calling believers to, to gather together to celebrate the goodness of God. In verses 1 and 2, when he says, Oh, come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. He's just pointing out that God is our salvation. He is the one who provides security and strength. God is the one who delivers, and God is the one that secures those who belong to him. And he says in verses 3 through 5 that the Lord is a great God and the great King above all gods. In other words, he is worthy of our praise because of his majesty. He alone rules over all creation. He rules over all creation because he created all things. Everything has been created by him. And that's the point he's making in verse 4. In his hand are the deep places of the earth. The heights of the hills are his also. The sea is his, for he made it. His hands form the dry land. And therefore, verse 6, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker. He is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the sheep of his hand. Let us fall before him because he owns us, and let us worship him because he cares for us, because God is our great shepherd. We are simply his sheep. But he calls out and says, today if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. And as in the day of trial in the wilderness, when your fathers tested me, they proved me that they saw my work. For 40 years I was grieved with that generation. I said, it's a people who go astray in their hearts. They don't know my ways. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. So here's an invitation. He closes with that. And I want you to see it. It's the last portion of verse 7. Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. Now, he's reminding them that the Lord cares for them. But even though the Lord does care for them, and even though the Lord cared for the nation of Israel, often his grace was met with rebellion. 
He mentions the fact that in the wilderness, the children of Israel who were being delivered by God from Egyptian bondage rebelled against him. God moved in a way that was so powerful, there had never been a time when a people who had been taken and had been in bondage as the Jews had been, there had never been a time when that nation had ever not only survived but also prospered. And God cared for them when Moses was taking them out of the bondage and through the wilderness. But while they were there in the wilderness, they rebelled against God. Ten times they rejected him, and ten times they rebelled against him, and ten times God showed them mercy. But ultimately, when they began to cry out and say, we're afraid that our children are going to die here in the wilderness, we should have remained in Egypt. When they did that, the Lord said then, if you're so concerned about your children and you want to return to Egypt, then what's going to happen is very simple. None of you are going to make it into the promised land. Your carcasses will litter the wilderness. And that's what he's warning them about. He's saying in verse 9, your fathers tested me. They proved me, though they saw my work. And for 40 years, I was grieved with that generation. And I said, it's a people who go astray in their hearts and they don't know my ways. And so they rejected God, and they rejected the works of God in their life. Now, that's a warning, by the way, that is, we're reminded of in the book of Hebrews in the New Testament. In the book of Hebrews in chapter 4, verses 2 and 3, the writer said it this way. He said, the gospel was preached to us as well as them, speaking of these in the wilderness. But the word which they heard, listen carefully, did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. For we who have believed do enter that rest, as he has said. So I swore in my wrath they shall not enter my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. I want you to hear this phrase. They heard, it says, the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. You can hear Bible study after Bible study. You can have a mom or a dad who loved you as a baby, dedicated you as an infant, put you in the nursery of the church that your father or mother has faithfully attended since you were born. And by the way, we have people in this church that I have watched grow up since they were infants. Uh, I'm thinking of one of, one of my, my little girls that I love with all of my heart, She's so special to me. She's one of the many in this church that are so special to me. And she has been dear to me since she was an infant in the nursery, and she bit Anna, my daughter, when they were both infants in the nursery. We have known her since she was that small. And I have watched her grow into young womanhood. I've watched her. She's going to be 22 years old. And I have a lot of kids that I have seen from the time they were five or six years old. I'm at the point now that I'm not only marrying, performing marriages for kids who grew up in our church, I've been dedicating their babies. And it's such a blessing. But you know what? You could be in a church just like that. You could have been raised in the church. You have a mom and a dad who took you to church every Wednesday, every Sunday. You went to the camps. You've been in all the Sunday schools from infancy all the way up into high school. And you've heard message after message after message after message. And I can tell you, I know kids in this church who are very dear to me that I've seen since they were small who rejected the gospel. And I've seen them on the street, and I've spoken to them even when they've come to church here, and their lives have gone down the tubes. And I've seen that too. I've seen the little girls who have grown up to have great lives. I've seen the other ones who have made poor decisions in their life. I've seen all of that. And the problem is, it's like the writer says, the word did not profit them. Why? It was not mixed with faith. They heard it over and over and over again to the point that they said, I can repeat that. I already know what pastor's going to say about this. I was here the first time he taught that, and I've heard him teach that same passage several times over my lifetime. I can complete his sentences. Well, it's not enough that you can complete my sentence. It's more important that you live out the message. And not everybody does that. And God said, listen, he said, you were in Egyptian bondage. You were under the taskmaster." 
and they would whip you and beat you, and they, and they dealt with you as slaves, and you were there as a nation for four centuries. And I raised up a deliverer by the name of Moses who came to you and declared himself to be the one that, that I had sent to draw you out. And you went with him, and you saw the wonders that were performed by me as you crossed through the Red Sea, as you walked for 40 years and your sandals never wore out. And I provided food for you. I brought quail to you when you were hungry for meat, and I gave you manna when you were hungry just to eat. And I did that for you 40 years, and you rejected me. And all you ever did was rebel and complain. You rejected me. You rejected Moses. You rejected everything that I did, everything I would do for you, because you simply did not believe, even though I performed incredible wonders that you'd never seen before, even though with, with the plagues in Egypt, I was able to, to, to secure your, your, your freedom and cared for you in every way, and it didn't profit you because you didn't add your faith to my word. Guys, that's the bottom line. It's not enough for me to be able to repeat a scripture. I need to hold fast to that scripture. And the best way to know the Bible, the best way to understand a passage, is to simply determine to obey what you understand. Because that's when God reveals his ways to you. It's one thing for God to show his works to you. But it's another thing entirely when God begins to show you his ways. You may know that God can do something. That's his works. But you, when you know his ways, that's when you know why he does something. You can speak to me and I can speak to you on a level of visitor and first-time conversation, and you can explain the things that I did tonight. Oh, you opened the Bible, you read some passages, you spoke to us, got a little political, came back to the Bible. But my kids can tell you why I do what I do. My wife can tell you why David Rosales does what he does. She knows my ways. Some of you only know my works. When it comes to the relationship with God, you can talk about what God does. Oh, yeah, God parted the sea, and God, you know, fed them with quail and fed them with manna and, and caused water to come out of a rock, and yeah, yeah, yeah. But you want to know something? There's a difference between repeating those and saying, hey, you know what? God has delivered me. God has taken me through trials. God has provided for me in my life when I was shoeless, and he provided funds so I could buy some shoes. God has supplied for me when I've been hungry and I've been praying and saying, God, I don't have any money. I don't have two nickels to rub together, but I still have bills I have to pay. Because God continues to do that. You know what I'm saying? Do you understand what I'm saying? It's not just talking about it. It's not the talk, it's the walk. And there's a difference. And some people only have the talk. I don't look to just the talk. I want to see the walk. Somebody can say, I love the Lord. That's one thing it's easy to say. But how about your brother? Do you love them? How can you say, I love God whom you have not seen? And you hate your brother who you do see. So show me your faith by your works. If you have faith, then you're going to have works. And those works will demonstrate what your faith really is all about. It's the difference between knowing what God can do and knowing why God does it. And the children in Israel did not know why God did what he did. They were lost. They didn't mix his word with faith, and they were judged. And so he's on the one hand saying, let us worship the Lord. Let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our God, our maker. Let us do that because he is ours. But remember, there are some who will not bow their knee to God and worship him because they walk in unbelief. So it's a call to genuine worship without hypocrisy.